It's a matter of life and death. Many of us have heard or used that phrase before, oftentimes with a much more frantic voice than I just did. It's a matter of life and death. Perhaps it's been a while since you've turned in a paper in school or had a test that was the next day, but for those who do remember that feeling of not being prepared for that paper or not being prepared to turn in that for that test, you might have said, it's a matter of life and death. Or perhaps working for a company, working for a business, taking on extra responsibilities th- and not quite being ready for them. And you might have said, it's a matter of life and death. Or perhaps you may have had to actually say this and not exaggerate in a 911 call saying it's a matter of life and death. Oftentimes this phrase is overused, but one of the times when I saw it recently used in a fairly good way, I thought, was the San Diego Blood Bank used, had a slogan that said, donate blood, it's a matter of life and death. And truly, it does make a difference if you donate blood. But like I said, oftentimes this phrase is overused. However, what I wanted to focus on with it is what exactly we're saying when we say it's a matter of life and death. When we look at that phrase, oftentimes it reveals a little something about us. It reveals the fact that we start with life. How often do we think of anything but, but, but uh, how often do we think of anything starting before birth? A conception, of course, we start with conception, but after that birth, then maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months, maybe a couple of years later, we have baptism. Then after that, many years down the road, we have confirmation, maybe a few years down the road after that, we have marriage, and hopefully many years down the road, we have death. But we oftentimes think of life in this way. We have life cycles that we look at. We even have development books, things like that, that teach us we should be at this stage at this time in our lives. However, when we look at Paul's epistle to the Romans today, when we look at chapter 6 there, it seems like he almost has things a little bit backwards. In fact, when you look at it, it almost seems that he's a bit on the morbid side. Rather than life to death, it seems like he's starting going, going from death to life. Just again, look at verse 3 there. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Seems a little backwards, doesn't it? When we think of the baptism of a child or even someone who's older in life, we don't think of them being dying. And I think it's partially because we don't like to look at the place where we were before we were baptized. I think it's partially because we don't like to consider how far we were separated from God before we entered the waters of holy baptism. I think it's because we don't like to look at that old Adam that still is hanging on inside of each of us, leading us to sin. Whether or not we want it to, that old Adam, that old sinful self, came to us before we were ever born. Before we had any choice to accept or to receive or any other verb, we were already sinful human beings. This is what is called original sin. And original sin is what separated us from God in the beginning. Original sin is what came into this world through Adam and Eve. It is what, it what, it's what keeps us from ever living a perfect life, from ever having the opportunity to save ourselves. Original sin is what lives in our hearts that leads us to do things that are not according to God's law. To do things that we want rather than what God's wants. And original sin didn't only affect us. But when original sin entered the world, it also cursed all of creation. Don't believe me? Just look out the window. Now right now, because of Jim, we have ryegrass planted, so it's growing. But if we didn't have ryegrass, what happens to the Bermuda grass? It starts to decay. It starts to grow old. And then it'll grow again once we get out of the winter season. But look at the flowers among us. We know that as long as we try to take care of them, well, they'll live for a while, but eventually what happens to that flower? What happens to the trees? What happens to the earth around us? See, original sin's entrance into this world didn't only affect us as humans, But it affected all of creation. From Genesis 3 on, 
Genesis 3, 18 and 19, God says right then and there that the earth would be cursed. And Paul again affirms this in Romans chapter 8. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Now perhaps you're wondering, how does the destruction and decay of our world, how does the reality of death actually apply right here to me? Well, have you ever asked that question, why? Have you ever said to God, why? Why this? Why that? The simplest answer we have is original sin. See, because of original sin's entrance into the world, we could never le live the perfect lives that God intended for us. Because of original sin entrance into the world, homes, families, lives, all that we hold dear is destroyed. Because of original sin, we suffer pain. We experience the effects of hatred. We see those divisions right around us all the time. Original sin does not cease to exist. And it seems to still be a problem. And because of original sin, we also reminds us how much we need a Savior. See, Romans didn't just focus us in on death. Certainly, that's where it began. And that is where we began. In death, spiritually dead, we began because of original sin in this world. In death, Christ died, but He also rose. And because of that reality in our lives, it means that we have forgiveness. It means that we have the opportunity of everlasting life because of Christ's resurrection. When we read those verses, because I, we were baptized into the death of Christ, we also know we were baptized into the life that He promises. Now Romans 6 is often used as a funeral text. It's not one that we regularly use when we're thinking about baptism. But that is indeed what it points us to. Because it was required that that old Adam had to be drowned inside of us. That old sinful self had to be done away with because we were brought forth in iniquity. In sin did our mothers conceive us. But in baptism, Christ did redeem us. Martin Luther says in his large catechism, Baptism is this, that we are sunk under the water which passes over us and afterwards are drawn out again. These two parts, to be sunk under the water and drawn out again, signify the power and operation of baptism, which is nothing else than putting to death the old Adam, and after that, the resurrection of the new man, both of which must take place in us all of our lives, so that a truly Christian life is nothing else than a daily baptism, once begun and ever to be continued, for this must be practiced without ceasing, that we are ever keep purging away whatever is of the old Adam, and that that which belongs to the new man must come forth. As we look at Luther's words there to us about baptism, we are reminded of the necessity that baptism is not a one-time thing. Yes, we come to the font one time. Yes, we come before the Lord that first time to be named as one of His children. But each and every day, it is necessary for us to remember again that we are baptized children of God that we are in need of that forgiveness. Each and every day, we are in need of coming before the Lord and asking His forgiveness again because we do live not only as saints redeemed, but as sinners. We do live as those who, ha who break God's law. We do live as those who separate ourselves from our Lord. And we do live as those who can come to that font who can experience those refreshing waters of holy baptism as often as we need to. See, the Lord invites us, not just on a weekly basis when we come together in church, but on a daily, hourly, minute basis, if you need, to come to Him.
to come to Him and receive that forgiveness. Through His baptism in the Jordan, He showed us the perfect example. Through His baptism in the Jordan, He ordained baptism for each of us to be holy, to be just, and to provide that forgiveness of sins. It is not the words that I say when a child is baptized. It is not the words that I say when I offer the absolution. It is the power of Christ Jesus. There is nothing we can do. There is no way that we can save ourselves. No matter how often we try to, no matter any ways we try to dedicate ourselves or put ourselves before the Lord, only, only by the power of His forgiveness can we be saved. And what joy we have. What joy we have knowing that we are children of God. What joy we have knowing that we are redeemed by the blessed power of Christ Jesus. That it is not on our shoulders. On our shoulders, over and over again we fail. But on His shoulders. On His shoulders that bore the cross for us. We find that salvation. Each and every day, we have an opportunity to celebrate that forgiveness. Each and every day, we have an opportunity to celebrate that we are children of God. What does this mean? This means that we share the love of Christ. And it doesn't have to be through our words. Many times, many times, I'll even say it from here, we are responsible. We have the opportunity by God to share His gospel message with the world. But it doesn't always have to be in words. See, as baptized children of God, we're also given the opportunity to live out our faith, to live out His requirements for us. And when people see that, when people see us living out our faith, it seems to me like they can't help but ask, what is different about her? What is different about Him? It seems like if someone sees you living out your faith, that they couldn't help but ask, what is different about you? And what does it mean to live out our faith? Well, we know it certainly doesn't mean to live a perfect life. That's true already. But it means that we do live differently than the world lives. It means that we do set a different example than the world does. That we hold our hel- ourselves to a different standard than the world does. It means that maybe we avoid watching those programs on TV It means that maybe we avoid seeing those movies in the theater that may not proclaim a Christian message. It means that when we raise our families, that we take time to celebrate our marriage, that we take time to celebrate our children. It means means that we stand up for what is right. Now this month, and in two weeks we'll be celebrating it, But this month is Sanctity of Life Month. This month is the month that is set aside by Lutherans for Life, by those who believe in the precious life that grows within the mother's womb to be a baby, a child. Not an embryo, not a fetus, but a child. This month is the month we set aside to celebrate that. And I encourage you, as Christians, as those living out your faith, that you consider those things which may not proclaim that message, those things which may undermine that a true life is alive. Because it's not just the child that is growing inside of a mother that is at risk with abortion, abortion clinics, but it is also those who are on the older end of the spectrum. See, many, when we start to disregard life, when we stop standing up for what is right, and when we stop living out our baptismal faith, it makes it easy to start for people to start taking back what it means for to live in general. Not only taking away a baby, a child's life, but eventually taking away the life of an older adult. And at what point do we stop then? Like I said, in two weeks in particular, we're going to look at the life that we celebrate each and every day in our Lord. But I encourage you each day, 
to look at your life as a baptized child of God. To look at your life as one who is redeemed by our Lord. To look at your life and to see that you were special enough to God that He chose to redeem you. And so when someone asks you, what is different about you? That you may answer, I am a redeemed child of God. In fact, why don't we try that out right now? Why don't we try that out? That answer, I am a redeemed child of God. Ready? One, two, three. I am a redeemed child of God. And as redeemed children of God, you share in the promise of salvation. As redeemed children of God, you have to have something to look forward to. And that is the hope, the full assurance of life eternal in our Lord. As redeemed children of God, may we depart in His peace now and always. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank You that You have redeemed us, that You have washed us clean, and that through our baptism You have made us our own, Your own. Lord, we pray that You would help us each day to live a life that proclaims Your Gospel message. Lord, help us to set an example that has people asking, what is different about You? That we may say, we are redeemed children of God. Lord, in our redemption, we look forward to the ultimate life that You provide for us. That as we pass from this death, from this world into death, that we look forward to the life that is to come. May we celebrate each day looking forward to that eternity where we will share in joy with you. In your precious and holy name, in Christ Jesus our Lord we say, Amen.